been working with him since. And um, not only is he uh, has a great scientific mind, but he's also a really uh, generally a good person. So um, the <clears throat> today, so in trying to decide what I was going to talk about today, um, I was focusing on the um, obviously herbs contributed to the field of chirality uh, significantly, and also to the biophenic chromatography. So I decided to use the tools developed by Herb and apply it to the uh, protein which I'm interested in, the SIRT6 protein. So initially, I'm going to um, go through the. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go through a brief history of uh, Herb's contribution to biophenic chromatography, and then I'll go through the introduction of SIRT6 protein and its application. Um, uh, characterizing its binding site. So in 1985, Irv Weiner and Jean-François Cloix immobilized the sodium potassium ATPase enzyme within an LC system, and they used it, uh, the um, columns for the capture of uh, endogenous human sodium potassium ATPase inhibitors. Subsequently, the same year, Jorgen Hermansen developed the first immobilized alpha-1 acid glycoprotein chiral stationary phase for the uh, enantiomeric separation of basic amine drugs. Um, and this was um, actually the first use of protein-based stationary phases for resolution of enantiomers. Um, in the same uh, issue, uh, Irv Weiner and Jaron Schill expanded the work and demonstrated that the work, um, that the AGP column could be used to separate uh, basic amine drugs on a large scale uh, with a huge sample cohort. And their publication was resolution of enantiomeric cationic drugs by silica-bonded AGP. The, uh, following that, initially Irv Weiner then immobilized the uh, chemotrypsin and trypsin enzymes with the purpose of the enantiomeric separation of chiral drugs. Um, however, upon the immobilization, they re realized that the enzyme was, remained catalytically active, so they, uh, th thereby developing the first online immobilized enzyme reactor. And in addition to showing that these immobilized enzyme reactors um, could be used for online synthesis. They showed that you can identify inhibitors and substrates in addition to determining enzyme kinetic parameters for the imers. Subsequently then, Enrico Dominici, Carlo Bertucci, and Irv Weiner in 1990 and 1991 developed the uh, HSA column where they mobilized it and showed that not only could you uh, determine binding affinities uh, on the HSA column, but you should also characterize the binding site. And uh, subsequently from that, David Hage, Karen Ochter, and Irv then studied the allosteric interactions with HSA columns. This is a huge advantage over classic systems where you cannot actually, it's not easy to study allosteric uh, effects onto a protein. Um, then Anne-Francois Aubry and Irv and Gabriella Massolini then immobilized the serum albumins from several species and demonstrated that there was differences in binding elution or, and elution order on, of the compounds were observed across the species. Um, as Irv already mentioned in the, his talk earlier today, this was expanded to uh, transmembrane proteins, Perlundal did the GLUT1 transporter, and then um, Irv expanded it to the, uh, his prototype with the alpha-3, beta-4 nicotinic receptor, and then after that we immobilized a ton of different transmembrane proteins. Uh, more recently, um, Irv, myself, and Alex Masiuk then showed that you can actually apply these columns to the separation of a complex matrix. In this case, it was tobacco smoke condensates, where you, sh you could look at what was retained by the column and then do a missing peak chromatography to identify uh, active components, okay? So there's multiple formats for the biophenic chromatography. There's the immobilized artificial monolayer, which has been uh, used uh, for the transmembrane proteins predominantly. You can also immobilize these proteins on the open tubular columns. Um, and more recently, we've shown that you can actually do these experiments on magnetic beads as well. So <coughs> the... Um, Biophenic chromatography has the advantages that you can characterize the protein ligand binding sites. So in every protein that we've immobilized, you can determine the binding affinity using frontal affinity chromatography. And with every transporter or every transmembrane protein or cytosolic protein that we mobilize, we always run a correlation analysis with the filtration assays or classic binding assays. And typically you get linear correlations with uh, R squareds greater than 0.9. Um, an added advantage uh, that you don't have with classic filtration assays that you have in biofinity chromatography is that you can actually study different conformations of a protein. So in the case of the p glycoprotein transporter, if it was immobilized, you could first study the substrate binding site, the first catalytic state, um, and then you would be um, looking at, for example, vimblastin as a being retained by the column. And then you can add 3 millimolar ATP to the mobile phase, 
and then that would induce a conformational change whereby vimblastin no longer binds very strongly, but cyclosporin is bound, okay? So this means that you actually have the protein conformationally mobile immobilized. Uh, we've also shown that with the nicotinic receptor where you've um, immobilized the nicotinic receptor and it's initially predominantly immobilized in the resting state and then subsequently um, exposed to an agonist goes to the desensitized state. So um, you can create, uh, as you saw with the uh, Irv's uh, talk on the OCT, we've created pharmacophores and molecular models with these, um, also with the nicotinic receptor with key stuff and uh, beta genergic receptor as well. So, and obviously these columns can be used for uh, screening for elite drug candidates. <coughs> All right, so that's the background. So I'm gonna go through now the introduction of the, um, where the CERT6 protein comes from and how it plays a role. So epigenetics is a study of heritable alterations in gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in DNA sequence, okay? So you essentially have a few epigenetic regulators. You have your methyltransferases, you have your histone acetyltransferases, and you have your histone deacetylases. These regulators control your gene expression via histone modification and or ATP-dependent nucleosome rem uh, remodeling. So this is your chromatin fiber here, and this is uh, essentially a zoom-in of the minimal unit of a chromatin, okay? So this is the, called the nucleosome. So you have your H1, which is not susceptible to acetylation or deacetylation, and then your DNA backbone is, DNA is wrapped around these eight histones, two copies of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. Each histone has a polylysine tail, which carries a net positive charge, okay? And that positive charge then interacts with the phosphate backbone of the DNA uh, to make a tight coil around the histones, okay? So then what happens is your histone acetylase transferase comes in, acetylates a couple of the lysines, thereby reducing the charge, allows the DNA to be loosened up, and then you can, transcription will occur. Okay, um, and then your histone deacetylase comes in, removes the acetyl group, um, causing the charge to be regenerated, and then the phosphate comes in sticks, and then you get the tight, tightly bound DNA around the histones. So acetylation is important for transcriptional regulation, and deacetylation is important for repression of gene expression. So as I'm talking about CERT6 today, the uh, focus is only going to be on HDACs. Um, currently, for the HDACs, there's four classes of HDACs. Class 1, 2, and 4 are all zinc-dependent DSLases, and class 3 differs from them in that these are NAD-dependent DSLases. They're not sensitive to class 1 and class 2 inhibitors. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's it. So class, what we're going to talk about is the class 3. Um, just a little background on sirtuins. CERT1 is the best studied member of the sirtuin family. It's been shown to reduce the inflammatory components of type 2 diabetes and metabolic disease. Uh, resveratrol is a very well-known activator for the CERT1 protein. Um, and then there's a, what I'm talking about today will be the CERT6 protein. It's a potential target for metabolic disorders and prevention of age-associated diseases. Um, when you knock out the CERT6 protein in mice, they show premature aging phenotype and lifespan shortening, developing several acute degenerative processes, and by three weeks of age, they typically die, okay? Um, in addition to having these issues, uh, knockout mice also had low glucose levels, okay? Um, and this is consistent with the fact that CERT6 is known to be a major regulator of glucose homeostasis. In C. elegans and fruit flies, it's been shown that CERT2 inactivated pathways promote longevity and that in addition also in mice, they did a comparison where they overexpressed the CERT6 protein and they compared it to wild type and they saw the, um, um, you saw an increase in the, uh, about a 15% increase in lifespan over wild type. Um, CERT6 also has been shown to play a role in DNA repair and chromosome stability. Uh, now, compared to the other sirtuins, which have been shown to deacetylate several, uh, actually, you know, 10 to 20 different types of uh, lysines, the sirtuin 6 has been only shown to uh, deacetylate telomeric H3K9 and H3K56. And the fact that it has no activity at at least a dozen other histone tail residues indicates it may have a high degree of intrinsic substrate selectivity, okay? And this is just a cartoon of the location. Um, CERT1, depending on cell type and tissue type, could be located in the cytoplasm or nucleus. CERT2 is in the cytoplasm. CERT3 through 5 are mitochondrial, and CERT6 and 7 are nuclear. So the goal then is right now for the CERT6 protein, there's not many drugs out there, okay? There's just very few, not even drugs. I mean, they just they don't know any inhibitors or activators of the CERT6 protein. So the identification of a new compound that could modulate CERT6 activity could be of great therapeutic importance, okay? Nicotinamide 
is the uh, was the initially the only known inhibitor. However, more recently, there's been several other publications with more identified. Uh, CERT6 activation would be beneficial for lifespan. I mean, this is a, what I told you about already with the mice, where they had overexpression, had a 15% longer lifespan. Inhibition may be useful for treatment of type 2 diabetes or immune-mediated response. Okay, so. As there's limited data, the, a good source for um, drugs is plant extracts. I mean, these are full. They have different scaffolds. It's a, it's a great source of plant extracts. Uh, this plant, this is a figure from Newman and Craig, published in 2007, and it shows that from 1981 to 2006, out of all the new chemical entities that were discovered or uh, done, were either 70% were nature-based or derived from a nature-based product. Only 30% of the drugs out there are purely synthetic in nature, okay? So a well-established approach for the identification of novel drug candidates could allow for the screening of constituents of medicinal plant and marine extracts. So the current approach for drug discovery with plant extracts is first you carry out your fractionation, you do chemistry-based separation, and then once you separate the compounds out, each fraction has to be tested for biological activity, okay? And then after that, you, you identify an active fraction, then you subfractionate that into several other fractions, and then you just keep going down and down until you get down to your individual compound, okay? Which is, I mean, it's fine, it works, people have done it, but it takes time, okay? So is there a better way? Well, if you could actually find the compound, active compound directly, you would save a lot of time. It would save you a lot of time to do it. So you can do the chromatography to uh, fingerprint the, the plant extract, and then you can isolate the active compound using biofinity chromatography or protein-coated magnetic beads. So this would be a targeted approach where you have your immobilized protein and you are uh, targeting a specific protein. You can identify the compound and then go to semi-prep and, and isolate the compound from the mixture. Um, this combines chromatographic format with biological recognition. So for the uh, synthesis, this is pretty basic chemistry. I mean, um, we, for the mobilization on the magnetic beads and the mobilization on the silica stationary phase, we just did uh, propylamine silica, uh, reacted with glutaraldehyde in the presence of sodium cyanoborohydride for Borch reduction, uh, resulting uh, free aldehyde over here, and then you mobilize the CERT6 protein by the N-terminal domain, okay? And then to immobilize the CERT6 by the C-terminal domain, we react that with the carbodiamide, EDC, um, form the intermediate, and then react that with the uh, amine-coated silica, and then you get your CERT6 immobilized on the C-terminal end, okay? So there's a number of different nuclear proteins, estrogen receptor, estrogen-related receptors, alpha and gamma, DNA and winding element, heat shock protein 90, HSA, there's a, so we've just done a, a lot of different cytosolic proteins that we've immobilized. So the idea then is to use the protein-coated magnetic beads to try to identify new compounds that bind to it. So the initial proof of principle was done with the human serum albumin-coated magnetic beads. So we took the HSA-coated magnetic beads, we dumped it into a solution that had uh, three known binders and three known non-binders, and uh, we picked out, uh, we showed that it could correctly uh, um, extract only the three known binders with leaving the three known non-binders in the wash solution. Uh, subsequently, then, we mobilized the HSP90 alpha uh, protein on the encoded magnetic beads, and we did the same experiment with the ligand fishing, and again, it worked. It picked, it, it picked out the, only the compounds that bound, but in addition to that, we showed that the HSP90 coded magnetic beads could also actually fish out a client protein from a complex matrix, in this case, a cellular matrix, okay? So we want to identify novel modulators from na natural plant extracts that target the CERT6 protein. So we've immobilized the CERT6 protein onto the surface of magnetic beads and want to go fishing, okay? So this is essentially the CERT6 is immobilized on magnetic beads. Here's your plant extract. If you have an active compound, this initial assay was a um, H3K9 deacetylation guided process. So what we were actually looking at is the production of the deacetylated histone peptide, H3K9, okay? So we were looking at whether or not we inhibited deacetylation or we activated deacetylation. So in order to do this, we first did the immobilization, as I showed you already. We immobilized the CERT6 protein on the N-terminal domain as well as in the C-terminal domain uh, by the methods previously shown. We had a catalytically inactive CERT6, which is the mutation of the histidine in the 133 position to a tyrosine. And this was also immobilized in magnetic beads. We also boiled the CERT6 in water for 10 minutes to do a heat denaturation of the CERT6 protein and immobilize the heat denatured CERT6 uh, magnetic beads. Um, 
And then, of course, we did a time course experiment from 1 to 18 hours to see when maximal deacylation occurred. And it was determined that maximal deacylation occurred after four hours incubation at 37 degrees. Um, so this is essentially what was in the HDAC assay buffer. We had TRIS. We had to have the presence of 200 micromolar nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD. And uh, we added five micrograms of the acetylated histone peptide H3K9. And again, we were measuring the production of the H3K9 from the deacylation of H3K9 AC. After magnetic separation, the supernatant was collected and analyzed by mass spec. Uh, this was separated in a Zorbax XTBC18 analytical column with the mobile phase there. And we not only separated H3K9, H3K9 AC, we also separated NAD and all its hydrolytic breakdown products. So this was the first experiment with the uh, four hour incubation at 37 degrees of uh, the CERT6 protein. And what you see is you see the production of H3K9 that's only seen in the immobilization on the C terminal domain. Okay? You see nothing produced in the N terminal domain uh, immobilization. This is um, consistent with what's been reported in literature that the CERT6 catalytic site is near the N terminal domain of the protein. So from this point forward, everything was immobilized on the C terminal domain of the, uh, of the, of the CERT6 protein. Um, the next experiment then was to see the specificity if we compared it to the controls. So we have here in buffer and black, in blue we have the CERT6 CT coated magnetic beads. In red, we have the heat inactivated CERT6, and in green, we have the uh, catalytically uh, inactive mutant, the H133Y. And as you can see in this figure as well, um, the H3K9 AC was only deacetylated in the CERT6 CT magnetic beads. Okay? We also tested it with the substrate that was not for the CERT6 protein, which is H3K14 uh, AC, and you saw no deacetylation of the H3K14 AC. Um, the next experiment was to test whether or not it was necessary to add the 200 micromolar of the NAD to the uh, incubation buffer. So we have the buffer here, um, the CERT6 heat inactivated in H133Y. And you have in blue is with 200 micromolar NAD, in red is without 200 micromolar NAD. So what you see over here is that the only place that you get the acylation of H3K9AC is in the CERT6 protein. Um, all right, and then uh, so what we have here is the um, let me just see. All right, the nicotinamide uh, is the only known inhibitor at that time for the CERT6 protein, and it was evaluated. Uh, we incubated with 100 micromolar nicotinamide for four hours at 37 degrees, and we showed that it actually blocked the acylation with a statistically significant decrease, about 40% decrease, relative to uh, a control where it was not present. Um, so that shows that the, the deacylation guided process works for uh, inhibitors too to identify inhibitors. We looked at resveratrol. It's a known activator of CERT1 to see if it had any effect on the CERT6 protein uh, for deacylation of H3K9AC, and it had no effect. We also looked at benzamide, which is an inhibitor of the ADP ribose polymerase of the PARP family, and showed that 100 micromolar benzamide had no effect on the deacylation as well. Hmm. All right. Um, so the fenugreek seed extract, so the next step was then to see whether or not how it worked with the plant extract. So when we were deciding which plant extract to use, we decided to use fenugreek seed extract. Um, this is just the extraction procedure from the trigonella seeds. And we chose this one because the fenugreek seed extract has been shown to lower blood glucose levels in type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients, as well as experimental diabetic animals. It's also been shown to lower cholesterol levels in the same uh, diabetic animal experiments. It's also been shown to reduce high-fat diet-induced body weight gain in obese mice. So we incubated it with 1% fenugreek seed extract um, in the incubation HDAC assay buffer uh, uh, incubation buffer, and we looked at the, at the level of H3K9 that was deacetylated. And what you see is a 60% decrease in the amount of deacetylation observed, which means that fenugreek, fenugreek seed extract contains some inhibitors for the uh, CERT6 protein. So initially, uh, what we wanted to do was to identify the CERT6 inhibitors um, within the fenugreek seed extract. We actually took a candidate approach prior to doing the fishing experiments, which I'll show you at the end. Um, but the major components of the extract, we looked at those. The major amino acid available inside fenugreek seed extract is 4-hydroxyisoleucine, um, and that's in white. The major alkaloid present is trigonaline in blue, 
Um, we added quercetin and vitexin, which are the major flavonoids present, and that's in uh, pink and purple. And then we also added two additional flavonoids, um, genistein and diatazine, just as controls essentially see if they had any effect. They were, those are not present in fenugreek seed extract. And what you see is, with the exception of quercetin and vitexin, none of these inhibited, but quercetin and vitexin inhibited deacetylation with quercetin at about 40% inhibition of deacetylation and vitexin at about 20%. Okay? Um, we wanted to see whether or not this effect was synergistic, so we combined them together, we incubated it, and uh, we did not surpass the 60% inhibition observed with just quercetin. Okay? So then we conclu conclu conclude that for the, uh, there's obviously additional compounds inside the extract that need to be identified. So for the conclusion of this section, we just showed, I showed that we developed a novel sur 6 deacetylation assay that we were capable of screening a plant extract, a complex matrix, in order to identify whether or not it was an inhibitor. And then we identified quercetin and vitexin as sirtix inhibitors. Now that we identified quercetin and vitexin, what we wanted to do was characterize the quercetin binding site. Okay? So in order to do that, what we did was we used biofinity chromatography. So here is essentially your open tubular column, 100 micron ID, and in blue is your sirtix 6 protein immobilized from the C-turbo domain onto the protein. Anything that goes through the column, so for example, the red stars you can imagine is quercetin, anything that goes through the column is retained um, and then it gives a frontal elution curve seen here. So this relatively flat initial portion represents your specific binding, then you have a vertical breakthrough and a plateau which represents saturation of the, of the column, okay? Your mobile phase and your wash buff are in the mass spike HPLC pump. Uh, you can run your mobile phase in one and your uh, wash buffer in the other, so you can just switch back and forth and automate it. Um, so that's your, and then we wanted to do this to apply a frontal affinity chromatography to determine the binding affinity. So here's your uh, frontal chromatogram of quercetin on the SIRT6 protein. So in A, you have two micromolar quercetin, and we have increasing concentrations of quercetin added. Here at B is five micromolar, um, C is 11 micromolar, 15, and then 100 micromolar displacement, okay? So what you get is a significant displacement, and by looking at 50% of the plateau um, and the elution time, then you can calculate the KD, okay, using nonlinear regression model. And the KD calculated for quercetin was uh, four micromolar. So um, here you have uh, what we decided to do is since we had quercetin and vitexin, we decided to do structurally related flavonoids, okay, to screen them. So vitexin is just the eight carbon glucoside of apigenin, so we ran apigenin. Camphorol difference with uh, quercetin, the only difference is in the three prime hydroxy presence here. And luteolin and apigenin, the only difference again is the three prime hydroxy here. We also ran naringenine and genistein, we knew from our previous studies that it was inactive, so that was our, our, our control. So we ran the uh, KDs, obviously genistein didn't have any displacement, so you can't get a KD. Uh, but for the remaining compounds, we got the KD of luteolin, uh, 1.8 micromolar, and apigenin was 1.9 micromolar. And again, the differences between these two is the three prime hydroxy. Camphorol and quercetin were 3.9 and 4. And again, the difference with those is the three prime hydroxy, which means it's not very important. Although these are relatively close anyways. Um, Naringenine was weaker at six micromolar. And finally, the texin with the eight carbon glucoside was the weakest at 15 micromolar, okay? So what we did is we determined the KD. So the KD means that we displaced the marker by itself and uh, determined the binding thing. What we wanted to see was do these displace quercetin? So in order to do that, we had to do frontal displacement chromatography. And what you do is you run your marker ligand, which in this case is two mi five micromolar quercetin, and that's an A. And then you run your displacers, okay? You run the same concentration of all the other compounds. And if it displaces quercetin for the quercetin binding site, then you know your specific binding at the same site. So what we did is you, and based also on the magnitude of displacement, you can get, uh, can re reflect the binding, okay? So you have, uh, for example, the weakest uh, binder uh, was vitexin with the smallest KD, and that had the smallest displacement of quercetin with the displacement about 15 minutes, whereas luteolin, which was the strongest at 1.8 micromolar, is G here, and that had the most significant displacement, okay? So you can see that, and all these others fall in line. I mean, uh, apigenin is there, um, C is naringenin, and then these are quercetin and um, apigenin. So now that we saw that the, uh, these are all competing with quercetin, what we wanted to see was could we use the single displacement, one single displacement chromatographic run on frontal chromatography to predict the actual deacetylation assay 
from the initial deacetylation assay I showed you, the H3K9 acetylate deacetylation assay on the magnetic beads. So we repeated the study with all, these, all the flavonoids tested here and looked at the level of inhibition. Okay? So what you have is luteolin had 54% inhibition, camphorol had 48%, all going down to uh, vitexin, which had 25%, and genistein had none. Okay? And then we compared it to the change in retention volume from the displacement of 5 micromolar quercetin. So you have here genistein at 0.3, which is essentially nothing. I mean, that's just not displacing. Um, and then you have vitexin at 14 minutes and luteolin at 36 minutes. And then we ran a linear correlation analysis between the level of inhibition and the change in retention volume, and we actually had a linear correlation with an R squared of 0.94. So that means this can be actually used as a predictive tool to determine whether or not uh, you're going to have deacetylation activity uh, as an inhibitor. Okay? So for this, actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to preface this with the fact that it's a very small subset of compounds, so it's not, uh, you know, it's still being refined. But the compounds, uh, we sketched these flavonoids either by uh, download from PubChem and Energy Minimize in Discovery Studio, and we generated a pharmacophore modeling was carried out in Discovery Studio with common features method. Okay? And this was the top ranked pharmacophore that was created for the uh, pharmacophore model one of the uh, quercetin binding site of the SIRT6 protein. You have three hydrogen bond donors and one hydrogen bond acceptor that was identified based on the model. Again, this is a very, very small subset of compounds, so it's probably going to change. Um, and then these are just how the flavonoids fit. And as you can see here, between camphorol and quercetin, um, the three prime hydroxies over here, it's missing it. And same thing with apigenin and lutealin, it's not going into the model. Um, and then you have the um, neuroginin over here fitting into the model. Okay? So the training set, the only, it was only five compounds listed here, and the test set was only vitexin, genistein, and diadazine. Okay? So right now we're in the process of screening a series of an quercetin analogs. We've already screened six additional ones. We're going to screen six more. And with the 18 compounds, we're, we're going to generate a new pharmacophore, maybe a more refined model. Okay? So this is for the um, uh, quercetin analogs. But we're still getting back to the fishing experiments. Uh, we still wanted to identify novel modulators of the SIRT6 protein. Okay? So the initial magnetic bead experiments was a deacetylation guided process where you're actually measuring the production of H3K9. In this case, this is purely a fishing experiment where you incubate the SIRT6 coated magnetic beads with the natural product, the fenugreek seed extract, for 15 minutes, 1% um, fenugreek seed extract. You then wash it, two washes, 10 minutes each, where you incubate with wash buffer, and you finally elude it with 20% uh, methanol. Okay. Um, and that's about a 15-minute incubation. And then you analyze the elution buffer and then you see what's stuck, okay? So for the uh, initial, this is the initial chromatogram, and this is the fingerprint of the fenugreek seed extract, okay? This is actually what we loaded. Um, and this is just one set of the chromatograms. We ran 100 to uh, 500, 500 to 900 in both positive and negative mode. Um, and in blue, you see the com this is just the chromatogram that was obtained. And then we extracted specific ions from the uh, blue chromatogram. Um, obviously, we determined where quercetin and vitexin were based on spiking it with uh, the standard. And so this is where quercetin eluded. This is not spiked here. This is purely from the plant extract. Um, but we know that quercetin is there because we had previously spiked it. Um, so this quercetin is what's present in fenugreek seed extract. And this is where the vitexin is. We also extracted a few other um, SIMs. And um, I'll show you the results here. Okay, so this is what was loaded. Okay, we threw away the wash and we only uh, looked at the elution buffer. So from uh, you know hundreds of compounds, we narrowed it down to at least in the mass spec with the positive ion mode to about seven compounds, and in the negative ion mode to about 12 compounds. Okay, so you have, and what we see is in the elution buffer, we actually did pick up vitexin and quercetin. Okay. And since vitexin is at 15 micromolar, we know that anything else that's been picked up is either going to be at least 15 micromolar or stronger. Um, so these are the remaining compounds that need to be identified. Uh, we looked at the 447. Looks like it's most likely the 8-carbon glucoside of luteolin, uh, but we need to still determine that. And then there's a potentially some, uh, potentially a saponin inside here. I'm not entirely sure yet, but we'll see. Um, so uh, that's it. That's the talk. The, uh, the conclusion is the flavanols, uh, apigenin, camphorol, and lutealin, and the flavanol, neuringenine, were studied against SIRT6 protein to generate a pharmacophore 
and uh, we generate uh, the coursing binding site. As I mentioned, we are screening an additional 12 compounds to refine the model. Um, we showed that the single frontal displacement chromatography can be used to correctly predict the level of inhibition of the deacylation activity of the CERT6 protein, and that the CERT6 magnetic beads were successfully used to fish out active compounds from a complex matrix. Um, currently, we're trying to isolate some of these compounds and determine whether or not they're activators or modulators. Um, so for this work, I'd like to thank Nagendra Singh, who carried out the uh, frontal chromatography, open tubular studies, as well as the fishing experiments in the end. Makoto Yusuda carried out the initial deacylation guided uh, assay, H3K9 assay. Uh, Saranjan Ravi Sanjran created the molecular model, and Dave Wilson and Sebastian Fugman provided the um, protein and also the financial support of NIA. And also, I'd like to say congratulations again to Irv for the receipt of the uh, Del Nagori Award. So that's it. I'm not using the activity. For the fishing experiments, the plant extracts, I immobilize the enzyme and I'm just looking at, there's no, just nothing, just pure protein. There's no NAD present, just fishing out the whatever sticks. And then the next step is then to apply it to the DS, once we identify a compound, to go back and apply it to the activity. Yeah. No, with the, yeah, the denatured enzyme, when we boiled it for 10 waters, was, uh, was enzymatically inactive. So, and that we use as our controls. We, after uh, boiling for 10 minutes and immobilizing the, um, that, that protein, we had no activity. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you haven't run into any practical difficulties running with the plant extracts because you want to be able to start and solve them. Yeah, so. Yeah, you can. I mean, that's the thing. So, what we're using. There's synergy involved. Yeah, there's synergy, exactly. There's synergy involved. So, yeah, I mean, this is. But it's, a, it's an improvement. So, but the, yeah, I agree with you with the synergy. But the, um, the extract that we use was just purely the ethanol extract that's commercially available. So, and um, obviously, yeah, you want to do the chloroform extracts, you want to do all of them and look, um, but it takes time. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending our symposium this morning. Congratulations again, Irv, and uh, enjoy the conference. <laughs>